It's a great job, Warren, stepping in for Dustin. Uh, not having prepared to lead this morning, great job. Hope Dustin gets to feeling better as he sips on some water or coffee or some other drink of some sort over here this morning. One thing I was supposed to announce along with the welcome for the Burmans on December 3rd is that Sunday night uh, we're going to have a reception and a baby shower for them and and so if you'll look at the note in the bulletin it'll explain more of that but we did want to say it publicly uh, in case some of you don't read the bulletin like you ought to read the bulletin Uh, but we do want to remind you to uh, plan to stay around for that reception you'll really want to get to meet this nice young couple and it'll be a good evening for us on December the 3rd. I wonder if some of you can tell uh, what exactly this is that I'm holding in my hand. Anybody up here toward the front, can you see that? Or what is that? Tin foil? Okay. Uh, Some people call this aluminum foil. Um, In Alabama, I used to preach at a a small town in Alabama, right uh, around Florence, Alabama, and there was this plant there called uh, Reynolds Aluminum, and they made this. They made this aluminum foil, and... And so everybody there would, of course, call it Reynolds Wrap. So I apologize if you hear me say this is Reynolds Wrap because I was kind of programmed to say that when I lived there because about uh, half the men in the congregation there worked for this uh, manufacturing plant. Well, uh, this is, in fact, a piece of uh, aluminum foil or tin foil, and we often use this uh, to aid in our cooking. Sometimes we use it, of course, to, to cover up something that's already been cooked, maybe if we're going to heat it, reheat it, or to store it in the refrigerator. Um, and that's exactly what this is. I remember going to school when I was in elementary school, and I, a lot of the things my mom would send in my lunch would be wrapped in this uh, aluminum foil. And yet, uh, that's exactly what was, that was exactly the purpose of that. But you know, after lunch, do you know what this became? Everybody did this as a kid, right? I mean, I wasn't weird, was I? Uh, everybody would wad this up because, you know, what this became afterwards was what? A ball, you know? And so we didn't have iPads and computer games in those days, so we had to, you know, figure out ways to entertain ourselves. So this became a ball. And since, so since I was um, really infatuated with basketball in those days, guess what this really became to me? Basketball. And so this, this was a basketball, and you know what a garbage can became? The goal, of course. Now, I bring this up uh, to ask you if you remember those days in school when, you know, the teacher was, was in the room, but then she would have to go out of the room. I don't know if teachers can do this anymore. I don't know if they can actually leave students in a room by themselves anymore. But, you know, when I was growing up, the teacher could actually leave the room. Sometimes she'd have to go make some copies or she'd have to go to the office for some reason, and, and they would leave the room. And, and so what would happen when the teacher left the room? What would happen when your teacher left the room? room. Well, chaos would happen, exactly. You know, the kids would just do whatever they wanted to do. Uh, and of course, what, one thing I would do is I would take my little um, basketball and I would start shooting hoops there in the garbage can. And that's just some of the things we would do. But well, you remember what your class would do. You remember what you would do. And, and here's the whole point of that. The whole point of that is you would probably behave differently than when the teacher went out of the room, when she was absent, to what you would do when she came back in the room. If you did what she did uh, when she was out of the room, um, the same as you did when she was in the room, you can tell me later, but I will not believe you. Because more than likely, you did a few things that... um, she would not want you to do. That, that's just the nature of being a kid. It's the nature of the absence of authority. Now, I want you to look at a Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. And, and one thing that's very interesting to me about this verse is that Paul is actually concerned about the behavior of his students uh, at Philippi. He's concerned about the, their affairs. Uh, he's concerned about, as you can see, their conduct. He's concerned about their behavior. And one of the things he's concerned about is it will be proper whether he is there or not. Whether the teacher is there or not, he's concerned that their conduct would be what it is supposed to be. 
And I think that's really the, the whole point of what he is trying to say. In, in a simplistic way, uh, our little illustration reminds us that you really ought to behave the same way whether the authority figure is there or not, whether your teacher is there or not. And, and that is what Paul is reminding them. He is reminding them that it's important to behave like a Christian and that there is conduct becoming of a Christian, and, and that should be true whether I am there or not. So he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of your affairs. In other words, I'll hear how you're getting along. Whether I'm there or not, let your conduct be according to the gospel or worthy of the gospel of Christ. And when you're looking at that verse, you see the word only there. In Philippians 1 and verse 27, that's the, the very first word in the verse. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. I, I think that's pretty impressive that that word is there because this, this word signifies the one thing that Paul is concerned about. Some might even say that this is the one thing that he is concerned about as he writes this letter. Listen, he says, only this one thing, this thing alone, this exclusive thing, this single thing, this is what I am writing to you about. It stands alone in importance. And, and what this is, is the name of our lesson today, and that is the conduct of Christianity. Paul is saying to them, listen man, it is important how you act as a Christian. It is important how you behave as a Christian. And I, he says, I want to tell you how important this is. He says, this is, uh, this is exclusively important. Above all things, this is important. And specifically, he says, that that conduct must be worthy of the gospel of Christ. One of the things that everyone is searching for, I think, is how to please others. It's the measuring up to expectations. And so we're studying the book of Philippians in this series. The series we're calling, um, this series is about what everyone is searching for. And I know one thing that everybody seems to struggle with is measuring up to expectations. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you, do you sometimes struggle with, with, in your mind, measuring up to how you believe other people think you should be. Does anyone struggle with that? I struggle with that. I, I wonder how other people think I should be. I'm a preacher. So how do people perceive me? How do people look at me? I, I worry about my influence. I, I'm concerned about that. And, and, and I, I worry about that. But, but I want to I tell you something. The, the reason this is significant. Remember what the, the whole theme of this book is. We said it from the very beginning. This, the, book, the theme of this book is, is about having joy and peace and contentment. And, and when you start thinking about the expectations of other people, I, I guarantee you that's not what you're feeling in your heart right now. You're not thinking, I, I feel good about this. Because you look around and you've got all kinds of people expecting all kinds of things out of you. At home, you've got expectations. At work, you've got expectations. And yes, it's true. Even at church, there are expectations. And so that really doesn't bring this, this joy and peace and contentment into your life. And so you say, well, how in the world does this lesson about the conduct of Christianity fit into that? Well, here, here's what I want to tell you. And, and this is going to, I hope, cause you to have some peace about your conduct. The only conduct that matters the only expectations that you should be concerned about the one that you should worry over about meeting their expectations is just Jesus Christ it's only Jesus that has expectations for you that you should really be concerned about and someone says well that means you know as a father or as a mother or as an employee or well, you know, you get that right, and all that other stuff's going to fit. All that other stuff is going to work its stuff out. So, yeah, there are expectations to being a father and a mother. And, and there are expectations, of course, for your employment. 
But I'm telling you, if you're concerned about measuring up to other people's expectations, there is only one thing you should really be concerned about, and that is measuring up to the expectations of Jesus Christ. And that is, in fact, the conduct of Christianity. And, and so Paul says that's the only thing that really matters. And so when you zoom into Philippians 1 and verse 27, he's really talking about an imperative here, and that imperative is your conduct. And as we look at this conduct in Philippians 1 and verse 27, I want to remind you there are three layers to this conduct. You can already see the, the, the most elementary part of this, and that is simply conduct. So let's talk about conduct for just a moment. There's an important Greek word here in verse 27, which is translated as worthy. And, and the Greek root actually means weight. And so Paul is actually presenting an image of scales with which people might weigh some fruit or vegetables. It, it might kind of look like this scale. And on one side of the scales is the gospel with its weight of demands. And on the other side of the, of the scale is the conduct of the Philippian church members, of the Christians at Philippi. And so it's as if Paul is saying, let your conduct be as weighty as the demands of the gospel. Or another way of saying it, let your behavior do credit to the good news. One translation even says, only let your manner of life, your conduct, be that of the good news. And it's what someone calls sharing the vision with those who don't see it. I want to talk about that for just a moment. Sharing the vision with those that don't see it. Paul says, I I'm writing to you about something of chief importance. Only, above all, exclusively let your conduct be worthy or as weighty as the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you say, what does this really have to do with the chief purpose of Christianity? What's the chief purpose of Christianity, someone might ask? And, and the answer I think that we should give is to share that vision with others. And, and I really think that's what Paul is trying to get through to the people here when he's talking about these layers of conduct. He's saying to them, your conduct is going to be seen by others and how they view your conduct is sharing the vision with others. This is the evangelistic aspect of how we live our lives. I know evangelism uh, is, in fact, sitting down and sharing with others about Jesus, conducting a Bible study or having a conversation about the Lord and, and what he means to you and what he means to everybody. That's evangelism, but but one part of evangelism that Paul expects everybody to be able to participate in. You say, I, I can't lead that Bible study maybe the way Robert Oglesby could lead a Bible study. But here's what you can do. You can make sure every day you live, your conduct is worthy of the gospel. That, that the way you live is sharing the vision of Christianity with others. Sharing the vision to those who don't see it. Because, let, let's face it. This is our biggest responsibility. He's talking about the biggest responsibility of all, and that is taking Jesus to the world. And the first aspect of taking Jesus to the world is the way that we actually live our lives. And so, as Paul B. Gilbert once put into a poetic form, you are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by deeds that you do and by words that you say, men, read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what's the gospel according to you? And so this first level just deals with our conduct. But let's add another layer to that. And another layer, if you look in Philippians 1 and verse 27, is not just conduct, but it's also citizen conduct. So let's add that next layer, citizen conduct. He goes a little deeper into the conduct of the gospel when he introduces a new, very rich concept. Uh, the phrase, conduct yourselves, as it is translated, is, it, it comes from a very interesting Greek verb. Literally, it means to behave 
as a citizen. And so that's why I'm saying we've got to be concerned not just about our conduct, but citizen conduct. Literally, this means to behave as a citizen. It's the word from which we get the word political. And, and what it meant in those days, it meant a city-state or a, a free state. So Paul is saying, you must conduct yourselves in a manner that would be proper for the conduct of a citizen. And, and I'll tell you, he's not talking about a citizen of this earth. He's not talking about a citizen of the Roman Empire. He's not talking about being a citizen, as, as we could relate to it, of the United States of America. He's talking about being a citizen of the kingdom of God. That's what he's talking about. And what's also very impressive about the Spirit's choice of words here is that it was a very culturally relevant expression. Paul was speaking the language of the people. For you see, the Roman world was not just limited to Rome in those days. We're, we're, we're looking at the church at Philippi. The city of Philippi was actually a Roman colony. And what that meant was that Philippi was basically a small-scale version of Rome. And i tell you this, the people there were pretty proud of that. They didn't live in Rome, but they lived like Rome. And they were a small-scale version of Rome. Ironically, when Paul first went to Philippi in Acts chapter 16, you can see this in verse 21, it, it affirms that they saw themselves as Romans. Those in Philippi, they, they identified as being Roman citizens. But here's something even more important, and that is, the ancient, to the ancient Greeks, this citizen state was not just a place, it was participation. It was not just a place to live, but it was how you lived. It was participating in the citizen process. And so the people viewed their citizenship as a partnership. They viewed their citizenship as a partnership with the other people to obtain the highest good for all of society. That, is, that was the concept of Rome in those days. But remember, Paul is not writing to them about being a citizen of Rome. He is writing to them about being a citizen, having citizen conduct of the kingdom of God. And so what he's saying here is this citizenship it's not just you living for yourself. It is you living for the betterment of the whole. It is you living for others. The individual citizen in those days would develop his abilities and his talents and his skills, uh, his successes, not for his sake, for, but for the sake of the community. And so when you start applying that to the kingdom of God, what does that mean? What it means is we, we live for others. We don't live for ourselves. And, and as we're going to discuss here in just a moment, we live consistent with the values of the state and the goals and the expressions of the kingdom. And that's what Paul is actually saying in Philippians 3 and verse 20 when he says that you should live as citizens of heaven. You be citizens of the kingdom of God. And so... We're talking about one thing here today. We're talking about being a citizen that is living up to the calling of the gospel. And he says, so, you know, you've got to be concerned about your conduct. That's the first thing we've talked about. He says, you've got to be concerned also about your citizen conduct. But then here's the third level of this. And the third level of this is consistent citizen conduct. This so is the final piece of the equation. How does a citizen of heaven really conduct himself? How does a Christian really live? I'll tell you how we're supposed to live. Go back to that illustration. If you were one of the, the, the very few that when the teacher left the room, you actually sat at your desk and you didn't talk and you didn't throw wadded up pieces of tinfoil around and you didn't run around, you were probably in the minority. Because what Paul is saying to them is, I want you 
to be consistent in your citizen conduct, whether I'm there or not. And so what we're really talking about here is, is finding people behaving like they are supposed to behave in a consistent way. As a matter of fact, when he says, I, I, I want to find your conduct worthy of the gospel, whether I'm present or whether I'm absent, absent he says, I, I want to, to find that conduct being right so that I may hear of your affairs. The word affairs there is, is basically a word that means I, when, when I find out about you, when I find out about you, I want to find out that you're behaving as a citizen of God's kingdom the way you're supposed to be behaving. And I find it very interesting that this very word that's translated here uh, as affairs, it's the word in Luke chapter 22 for when they kindled a fire out in the hall. When Peter gathered with those people and they kindled a fire. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that the affairs or, or the conduct that he's referring to here is, is a, the type that would be like kindling a fire. So, so what do you do with a fire? When you get a fire going, you've got to keep it kindled. You've got to keep it, you've got to flame the fire uh, fan the fire, I should say, so that you'll continue to have the flame. You've, you've got to be observant of that. You, if you get a fire going and you just leave it alone, it's going to go out. And so you have, to, you have to do things consistently to make it continue to burn. And so that's what we're talking about here. The key word here is consistent. Consistent with what we know, with what we teach, with what we preach, with what we believe. And what that really is, the bottom line, what that really is, is integrity. Being a person of Christian integrity. It's been said, the thing that is stripping the church today of all of its credibility is that it says one thing and does another. Okay, so this is, this is where you've got to really start thinking about your life. Are you saying one thing and then living another way? Are you really being consistent? Are you being a person of integrity? It's been said the greatest weapon that the church has is its integrity. You see, God's called us to be different. And, and, and I'm telling you, there's something we, we need to be willing to embrace. We get so concerned about not uh, about looking different as Christians that we miss the purpose. The purpose is for us to look different. The purpose is for us to be different. The purpose is for us to believe different. And when we forget that, and when, and when our message is we need to be different, and then we go out and our lifestyle is we're the same, that's not integrity. And we're forgetting this is a great weapon for the Lord Jesus Christ. When people see us, or when they hear us say one thing, and then they, they see us live up to that, that's integrity. And, it, and it, what it means is that's believable. That person believes, and that person does. And, and you know, so, yeah, this, this thing called Christianity, it's a little different. This is the world thinking. That thing called Christianity, it's a little different. But I tell you what, I appreciate it, and I can respect somebody. I, I might not even agree with it, but that person says they believe something and they live what they say they believe. And that's powerful. That is very, very powerful. That is consistent citizen conduct. Now, someone says, how can I know that I'm doing that? How can I know that I am doing that? Let me give you five very quick things as we close our lesson that will help you understand if you are living the way that Paul says you need to live. And, and they're right here in this text, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. The first thing he says if you're doing this, you'll be doing is you'll be standing. Notice that he says there in verse 27 that you should stand fast. What's the opposite of standing? Sitting. So he says, you, you've got to stand up for something. 
You've got to not only say that you believe these things, not only teach that you do these things and practice that you believe these things, but then you've got to stand up and do those things. If you go over just about two pages in, in your Bible back to the last chapter of the book of Ephesians and look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 14, four times Paul says you've got to stand. Stand up and go to war for the Lord. Now, to listen to some Christians today, they'd have you believe that there's nothing a Christian ought to do anymore. And I've been hearing this for years, and it's wearing thin. Somehow, we've allowed, allowed others to label the doing and the obedience. And exactly what Paul's talking about here, the Christian conduct as being legalistic. We've allowed other people to define the narrative. We've allowed other people to say, you people that believe you ought to do things for the Lord, you're being legalistic. And you know what it seems those people really want us to do, instead of stand, they expect us just to sit around and do nothing. Listen to what Joshua Gibbs wrote about this. He wrote, quote, Christians in this country have heard Doing X does not make you a Christian for so long that they do not know what Christians do. Isn't that interesting? We've had people tell us for so long that you can't say doing that makes you a Christian. And we've listened to that for so long, we've just forgotten what it means to be a Christian and what Christians ought to do. So the first thing you need to do if you're going to be one who has consistent citizen conduct, is stand. The second thing, share. He says, stand fast with one mind. So they're standing and then they're sharing. Stand fast with one mind. He doesn't say stand fast alone. How depressing would that be if we had to do this all by ourselves? But no, he says, stand fast with one mind. Not standing alone, but standing fast together is the whole idea here. Church and everything to do with it is not a la carte. You don't do what you want to do. You do what the church is supposed to do. We do what we do together. You don't come to church for yourself. You come to church for the body. And when we start looking at, you know, I'm just not getting anything out of it anymore. Or when we say, you know, this service project that we're doing, it, you know, it, it, I don't really like what they're telling me that we're going to do for that service project, so I'm just not going to participate. When we start thinking like that, you know what? We're, we're thinking for ourselves. That's who we're thinking for. We're only thinking for ourselves. Church is about standing together. It's about doing together. And so he comes to the third thing, and that is striving. He says, stand fast with one mind, striving for the faith of the gospel. And so you put all that together. We stand together, and we work together. Two other very quick things. He says, you be sure about this. Look at verse 28. He says, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. I want to tell you, as we stand together and as we work together, we don't have anything to worry about. We can be confident. We can be sure. Is the enemy real? Yes. Are we against the world? Yes. Does the world look at us as the church and say, y'all are a bunch of weirdos? Yes, that's what they're going to say. But we're under worry. We can be sure that we're doing the right thing. And there's one last element of this. It even may come down to the fact that you have to suffer. And so there might be suffering involved in living as a consistent citizen having conduct
that is consistent with Christianity. He says in the very last verse here, or verse 29 and 30, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. I want to tell you something. If Jesus Christ is worth believing in, do you believe in Jesus? If Jesus Christ is worth believing in, Paul says he's worth suffering for. So are you willing to do that? Consistent citizen conduct. Are you a citizen of God's kingdom? And if you are, are you doing these things? Don't be concerned about what other people think about you. If the world's laughing at you, if they're making fun of you, if you believe in Jesus, he's worth suffering for. And that's okay. Be sure and be confident in that. Let's stand together. Let's work together. Let's worship together. Because we're the church. And that's what we're called to do. If you're not a member of the Lord's kingdom, we're excited to be a member of it. And we're happy to be a member of it. And we want to invite you to be a member of it as well. Entry into the kingdom of God is through your faith, repentance, and baptism into Jesus Christ. Uh, that's laid out very clearly in the New Testament. If you'd like to study about that more, we'd welcome you to sit down and to study those things together. But if, you're, if you know that and you're willing and ready to do that, based on your belief in Jesus, if you want to be baptized into him today and become a Christian and enter into the kingdom of God, we want to welcome you. And if you are a citizen of this kingdom, how have you been behaving? How have you been behaving? The only real authority is the Lord. The only expectations you really need to worry about are the Lord's. And so how have you been behaving? And if you're ready to make some changes, that's really what the invitation is about. And if we can assist you, we'll do that right now as we stand and as we sing.